and he has special warranty deed. What do you think your second contract should say? Same, Same thing. But instead, your contract says you're going to give a general warranty deed, uh, warranty deed, and now you have a problem because you're giving a full warranty and the bank's giving a limited warranty. You see the problem? So hopefully you understand that I can answer more questions privately about that. But you want to make sure it matches. If it says special warranty deed, the one you want to stay away from is what? Quick claim deed. That's the one you want to stay away from. Quick claim deeds mean I can, I can deed you my interest in this hotel for $500. And you say, wow, I'm going to get your interest for $500. Yeah. What interest do I have? I can give you a deed for anything, but it's only what interest I have. I'm giving you everything I could possibly have for a fee. So you need to be careful of quick claim deeds. It's very, very, very scary. And that's kind of what they look like. You see people prepare them themselves. They're totally wrong and they cause, cause title claims down the line. So you need to be careful. Don't prepare your own deeds. Quick claim deeds are very, very, very dangerous. Unless it's a divorce or an interfamily transfer. You want to stay away from quick claim deeds because they could potentially void your title insurance and cause you issues down the line. So I think you kind of got most of this when we talk about who's, who's actually represented. So if you're forced to use the bank's title company, as the attorney Jerry said, you want to make sure you hire an attorney because the bank does not represent you. The bank represents the transaction, but who do they look out for? The seller. They do not close without a hold harmless. Which basically means you're signing a hold harmless agreement that says anything that may come up is not covered. Anything. Don't call us. Don't bother us. Don't call us. If there's any mistakes, leave us alone. Unless it's a title claim and you can go to your title insurance. But I will tell you a lot of title claims are not covered. That's an insurance policy. Right? So there's always exceptions to the policy. So that's why it's very important not to let someone else dictate the title company. They, a lot of times, do not disclose title defects. I've seen liens be put as an exception to the policy and they hope you don't see it. It's very, very scary. They do not disclose title defects. If their re-foreclosure is needed, a lot of times they don't even address it. And if it comes up later, you're stuck. So sometimes we call for a re-foreclosure and they don't. We have to go to them and point out why and then it stops the closing. We close, my office can tell you, we're closing a lot of deals from 2016 and 17 that had to be re-foreclosed and they just wait, they get dragged out. They do not order permit searches, we spoke about it. If it's not included in the contract and they're representing the seller, you think they're gonna order a search that could potentially kill the deal? No, why would they? You think they're looking out for you? No, but now you know that. If they're doing the closing, you know to ask for a permit search. And they're going to say, well, we don't order it. Right? And that's going to tell you who you're doing business with. You want to make sure you get it ordered. They do not understand investors. We talked about that, that you can lose your deal. They do not allow flips. So if you're looking at wholesale, stay away from the bank's title company. They will not allow flips. And they don't have lower fees. Their settlement charges and attorney's fees are much, much higher. So the moral of the story, does the bank look out for you? Is the seller looking out for you? If you're the seller, is the buyer's title company looking out for you? No. That's why you may need to maintain control of your deal. It's very, very, very important. But that's probably the most important thing you can walk out of here with, is do not lose control of your deal to anyone. E-recording, this is new. E-recording is something that has come up. Uh, it's e-recording and e-notarization. So we were the first title company approved in the state of Florida to do a fully automated closing. That means we e-sign, e-notarize, and e-record. You could be sitting in another country, as long as you have a U.S. government ID, passport or driver's license, we can close. We were the first title company in the state to be approved to do it. Yes. There was someone who got the closing done before us, but we were the first to be approved to do it. It was the, we were the only underwriter, uh, Westcorp was the only underwriter that decided to, to take a risk on it because it's still in, in the court system to be able to be approved that it's not legal, but uh, talking about electronic signatures, there's a bill uh, that hasn't been passed yet, but they've decided to take the risk. And then a bunch of other underwriters have now joined. And there are a lot of attorneys that do not like it. And I spoke to Jerry, he did a webinar tonight uh, or today, and he said, wow, this is pretty interesting, what's coming down the pipeline. 
So these are fully automated closings. And this is kind of unique for us because we have a lot of clients that are overseas. I have one client in South America. He literally flies into the States to do his closing because it's cheaper for him to get on a plane and fly than to drive however far he has to drive to the consulate and book an appointment. It's very difficult. So now he can be sitting in his underwear in his house with his photo ID and a, a camcorder, you know, a computer, and it's very, very simple. By the way, if anyone has low battery this charging, only one person used it. I have uh, rapid charging cables for pretty much every phone, so use it. So it's electronic. We basically e-sign, e-record, e-notarize, everything is electronic. It closes the gap. So basically, the hard money lenders love it because we can close today, and in certain counties, I can record your deed in 15 minutes. That's unheard of in this industry. Usually it's a week to two weeks. We've used to send documents to Palm Beach County and they've lost them. They're sitting in a closet somewhere and they get recorded three months later because the FedEx got lost. Or we have to send a courier and they only go once a week to the courthouse and they put them in a lockbox to get recorded. So this has changed the industry, especially for investors that are buying, fixing, and selling because what do you have to be worried about? Time, your 90 day window. See, the problem is the banks do not realize the closing date is actually the date the closing took place. But the lenders say it's the date the deed was recorded. So if your deed took three weeks to get recorded, your 90 days do not start until that deed is recorded to be able to resell for a profit. So it's very important to make sure close today, record today. Very, very, very important. Closes that gap in time. And it protects you. That's the key, it protects you. And then we also locate discrepancies. That's another good one because they reject documents and we can see the same day as the closing, hey, this was wrong on the document or you know something wasn't legible, a signature, we can resubmit immediately. As opposed to mailing it to the courthouse, waiting, getting it back with a note as to what's wrong, fixing it, mailing it back. Weeks go by without documents getting recorded. So it's very important and it's pretty cool. We do a video conference now with closing. So as long as you have a computer with a laptop or a cell phone with a mobile app, we do the closing, it's all electronic, we video record the closing, so if we ever have to go to court, we have you signing. So it's even more secure than your standard notary. How many of you have done a closing with a notary, right? Do you think they actually looked at your ID or you gave them a driver's license? Does your driver, how many of you your driver's license looks like you? <laughs> Mine doesn't. So think about it, so this one's a lot more secure because we check through LexisNexis security questions. Like you ever apply for a credit card and they ask you, you know, what street did you live on out of these four? And only one answer is right. So we ask a lot of questions to be able to validate who you are. So it's more secure than your typical mode. Bankruptcy and probate issues, they're not common in real estate, but we see it a lot uh, in, in the investor world. We see it more than, than your standard ones. Because who's going through bankruptcy? foreclosed owner, someone who has credit card judgments, car, lo you know, car loans that, that are going south. So we do see it in the investor world. It's not that common though. Um, but properties, people always say, well, no, I'm allowed to sell the property. It wasn't included in my bankruptcy. If you're in bankruptcy, you cannot close without approval. You need the court's approval to release it, in order to release it from the bankruptcy because the bankruptcy court is entitled to any assets that you have. So if you have equity, most of those don't have equity. So they go to court, they file with the judge, say there's no equity, we're walking away with nothing, we just want to sell the property, and the judge says, okay. And they do what's called an order to release the property. Probate we'll talk about when we get into trusts, but probate is basically when someone passes away. And it's, it's a, a pretty unique, we do a lot of probate closings. Timing is everything when it comes to bankruptcies. You know, you need to know the filing date, the discharge date, was it a chapter seven? Was it a chapter 13? So by you collecting the information ahead of time and asking the questions when you're meeting with a distressed seller, are you in foreclosure? Is this gonna be a short sale? Are you the owner of the property? Are you the heir to the estate of who passed away? Because you're meeting with someone who doesn't, whose name isn't on the property appraiser's site. Maybe it's a child, a personal representative. So you, by asking these questions ahead of time, will set yourself up so now the closing doesn't have to be stopped and you have to wait three to six months to deal with issues like bankruptcy and probate because you ask the questions ahead of time. 
So knowing and to be properly prepared now will prevent your problems later. Make sense? Court will determine errors when we talk about probate. You see a lot of multiple state owners. So probates are a really good one. A lot of people ask me, what are the best types of deals that, that you see? And I like to tell probate. Probate is the largest profit to wholesalers and rehabbers that I've seen. Because these people are out of state, sometimes there's two, three, four heirs, they all don't get along, so they all just say, I want $20,000 and I want to walk away. So you're able to give each one 20, and if there's four, you pay how much? And the property's worth 200 fixed up, and it needs 30,000 in repairs. Do you think it's profitable? Absolutely. So probate is a unique type of, of deal to, to find. If you can find it, you can make a lot of money. And without giving you legal advice, use a trust to avoid probate, even in the house you live in. We'll talk about that. Forgery and fraud, do you think fraud happens? We talked about wire fraud all the time. Property fraud, property fraud happens every single day. Every single day it happens. My spouse is out of the country. I had one today where they were asking to wire the money to the husband when the wife was the one that owned the property. Is it fraud? Maybe, maybe not. But what will happen if I wire the husband the money? The wife's going to come back and say, he forged my signature. He knew that notary. It's happened. We just were dealing with Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department on another closing that happened where the, they sent the documents to us, and that was the exact case. The husband had a notary forge the wife's name to sell the property. He forged the check because he split the proceeds, half to him and half to the wife. He had that person forge the check cash it and took all the money. Wow. Happens every single day. We talk about quick claim deed properties, electronic funds transfers. It's scary, guys, what's going on in this market. So what do you need to make sure is in place? Cyber liability insurance, right? That's what's gonna cover a lot of that fraud. This was the, our biggest claim to fame. We were on NBC, we caught this guy here. You can see the story, it's pretty cool on our website. Uh, home stealing scam. We had the FBI, the Broward Sheriff, the State Attorney, Fort Lauderdale Police all involved. There was a huge sting operation. There were about um, 12 deputies outside the office. There was a guy with uh, fully loaded behind this wall, ready to charge in. They made me do the closing, which I usually don't sit the closings. They made me do it, because he was a convicted felon for armed robbery, so they didn't know if he'd have a gun or not. So it happened that he wasn't violent, but he was, it was a home stealing scam. He defrauded one of our hard money lenders already years ago. They never prosecuted him. First American Title, so if you know that's a pretty large national underwriter, wrote an entire fraud seminar on this guy. Wow. And when I called them and said I caught him, they said, how did you catch him? I said, it was very simple. So we caught the guy, he was stealing five houses. Two, uh, one was from the closing, this one, and I caught two others that I stopped and one went to foreclosure before he was able to sell it. But he was basically forging deeds into his name, using the land trust, satisfying mortgages which, with a fraudulent satisfaction, and taking it to a title company, selling it free and clear. Easy to do, very, very easy to do. So that was a pretty cool story, but does fraud happen? Yes, don't be a victim to fraud. There's a lot of things you can look out for uh, to, to prevent that. Just being, being in the know and knowing some of these things, you're going to prevent yourself from these types of issues. <clears throat> now it's the fun stuff for the investors. We talk about double closings and flips. How many of you are here to learn about wholesaling? Okay? Wholesaling is the process of basically buy today, sell today, and make what? Money. It's for people that may not have enough money, Maybe you only have enough for the $1,000 deposit and you want to get into this business so you're able to find a deal, put up a small deposit, wholesale, make profit. How much are you going to make on a wholesale deal? Varies. $2,000, $3,000, $5,000. Depends how many people are involved. Right? Sometimes there's two, three people involved on a wholesale deal. You know, because we put them all in the closing statement so we can see. So if you go to the bank and you say, I want to flip this property, what are they going to say? No. Why would they want you to flip something that's going to take, their, take money out of their client's pocket? So you need to be careful what language you use with the real estate agent. Do not think that that real estate agent is representing you. Be very, very careful what you tell them you're going to do with this property. 
What you do with it is none of their business. If you're going to buy it and sell it, it's none of their business what you're going to do. Get it under contract, lock it up, follow your contract according to the terms, and you'll be okay. Don't tell them you're flipping, because they'll find every reason to cancel. One of the downsides to a double closing are two sets of closing costs. Closing A, closing B. Makes sense, right? That's one of the downsides, and we'll talk about uh, where you can save that. Closings must be simultaneously, meaning we're going to close today A, close today B. Record the deed A, record the deed B. Everyone gets paid. So it's done simultaneously, same day. Do you do both closings? What's that? Do you do both closings? Sometimes. Usually, yes. There is a risk of not doing it where someone's handling the first side, and we do have a program in place. We actually wrote the FLIP program originally many, many years ago with First American, where they didn't know about double closings, and we wrote the whole outline of how they're handled. So we are one of the few that can handle it properly when we're not doing both. Most places won't do it. But there are measures that you can put in place to protect the interest. We take all the risk, but there's certain things we can do to make sure it's, it's done properly. So yes, it doesn't have to be at both. So both at one, but we prefer it that way. Title company has to be investor friendly. We talked about that. Hard money lenders love it. Hard money lenders will do double closings. They will fund the second side. They will. They'll fund the second side. If we're, usually we have to do both. Sometimes we'll get away if you're a good borrower. Uh, they will do it if the bank's title company is doing the front side and we're doing the second side. But, the, but it definitely can be used if you're going to buy, fix, and sell and buy from a wholesaler. The reason the investors that are buy, fixing, and selling are buying from wholesalers is why? Because you don't have the time to fix it and find it. You just don't have the time, right? So you need to use a wholesaler to bird dog and find the property, and then you buy it, you fix it, you sell it. That makes sense? <clears throat> we love using e recording again because it closes that gap in time. Deed A gets recorded, deed B gets recorded. We've dealt with the bank's title company sometimes three months to get a deed recorded because there was an error, there was a mistake, they forgot to attach the legal description. Somehow the name of the buyer got changed after closing, after the deed that we approved. It happens. So that's why e-recording is so important. So we tell them, do you use e-recording or a hand courier? We will not allow you to FedEx deeds to the, the courthouse. It's not safe anymore. We need to make sure someone physically brings it down to get recorded. And then the one way to save the money is an assignment of contract. If you do an assignment of contract, they need to be handled very delicate. They're a very delicate transaction because that's basically where you're going to an end buyer saying, I'll sell you the property for this amount of money, which is the same that you're buying it for, and just pay me an assignment fee. So you're disclosing your profit. So double closings, two sets of closing costs. Assignment of contracts, one set of closing costs. Double closings, nobody knows how much money you're making. Assignment of contract, everyone knows how much money you're making. Make sense? So I, people always ask, well, what is the guide? And I say, well, if you're making roughly what a real estate commission would be, three to six percent. If you're making less than six percent, I would say you could probably get away with an assignment of contract with the right language. Not every time, but usually. I've seen thirty, forty thousand dollar assignment fees every day. But usually, I say the 6% guide. If you can get away with it larger, one of my good investors called me the other day, it was a $70,000 assignment fee. He says, what do I do? How do I structure the deal? I said, double closing all day long. Because you are not going to be able to sell that $70,000 fee. And he actually went in and fixed the property beforehand. You know, so there are a lot of factors to a deal. So you want to always ask yourself, are you making a, an obscene amount of money? You need to do a double closing. You pay two sets of closing costs. You pay an extra thousand or two in closing costs to hide your profit. Now they'll know your profit later, but they don't know it now. And then a so the assignment of contract I talked about. Um, the one unique thing I talked about with assignment of contracts is release of liability. An assignment of contract could be two ways. First, your contract is either assignable or not assignable. By the way, if you didn't enter the text code, you want to do that now because you have less than 10 minutes to we pick a winner. Just so you know, if you want the box, so I have three boxes of wine, by the way, not just one, there's three. So you have three chances to win. Um, so 
A contract is either assignable or not assignable. Are the bank's contracts assignable? Absolutely not. A standard seller? Absolutely. That could be assignable if the box is checked. But then there's another part to it. Once you assign it, are you either released from liability or not released from liability? What does that mean? That means if your end buyer does not close, you either have to step back in and close or you could lose your deposit. So if you're released from liability, you're released. You can get your money back. If the buyer doesn't close, you walk away. If you're not released from liability, you have to keep your deposit up and you can't get it back until your end buyer closes. Does that make sense? So it's two different ways of doing it. And it's all the art of the closing, like I said. You need an investor from the title company that can massage that deal to the closing table if you're doing an assignment. It's just a fact, otherwise you will lose. I have one, another one of our good investors uh, who probably does, I would say 10 closings a month with us, decided he wanted to, uh, it made sense for him to go open his own title company, right? Partner with an attorney and do his own closings. And you're doing 10 deals. Like, I, I wish you the best of luck. Do it. It makes sense for you. You'll, you'll save money on your, your bottom line. They screwed up deal after deal after deal after deal. They're not back as our clients. We don't burn our bridges. We wish them the best of luck. We help them massage their deals. And we make sure that they came back because they know we're going to get that deal closed. They lost money. They lost deals because the person at that title company had no clue about investor flow. So it's very important, that part of the closing. Transactional funding is used when flipping a deal. Very important. Transactional funding can range anywhere from $450 to 2% of the closing, depending on who you call and who you do the closing with. That's basically if you are sitting in the room and you say, well, I'm going to buy this property for $100,000. I only have $1,000. Where am I going to get the other $99? That's what transactional funding is. Lex offers it, so if you're one of his students, you know that he offers it. It's basically where he will put up the cash for you to close. So if you get a property for $100,000, you put up a $1,000 deposit, he'll put up your ninety-nine dollars to close, so you can wholesale it to an end buyer. Because the two closings have to take place independent of each other. If anyone is doing them where they're doing using the end buyer's money to fund the front closing, stay away. Because if you have a title claim, they could deny the claim, saying the closings were not independent of each other. So it works, as long as everything is good. But I'll tell you, when it doesn't work, and there's a problem, that's what you have to look out for. So it's the last piece of the puzzle. Cost for funding, I already told you about. It's known as flash funding. It's used closing at either one title company or two title companies. So if you're closing site A at the bank's title company and site B with us, we'll complete site B. And we'll call the transactional funder and say, you're now authorized to fund the front side. They'll fund the front side, we fund the second side, everyone gets their money back, and you get what? Hey. Hey, that's the important part. You can't use the empire's money we talked about. And it doesn't require a mortgage note or credit. So if you have bad credit, can you do this business? If you're sitting here and you know you have five, 600 credit score, and you say, well, I just don't have the credit, don't worry about it. If you have at least $1,000 to put down, you can get into this business. And you can make a lot of money. All you need to do is find the deal. Find the deal, put up the deposits. Can it be less than $1,000? Absolutely. Can it be zero? No. You have to put up some consideration. So you can put up a dollar. You can give the seller a dollar and say, sign the contract, here's a dollar. And it's a valid contract. You have to have some consideration in the state of Florida. But you don't need credit. You don't need a mortgage, you don't need to sign a promissory note, and you don't need to have any risk. If you close, great. If you don't close, you could lose your thousand dollars. That's about that's your limit of risk, is the thousand dollar deposit. Code violations and permits, we talked about that permits are not uh, covered, but utility bills, those ten thousand dollars that Phil said utility bills, can become a lien. Permits aren't covered, code violations accrue daily fines. I've seen code violations in the millions of dollars because it's been accruing for years. That house that we did the fraud seminar on, nine years it's been vacant with code violations. Nine years. It's still sitting there. The bank doesn't want to sell it. We've brought them numerous offers. And I said, I have the actual legal seller. I got title put back in his name. And I said, he's willing to sell. They won't entertain an offer. So it's millions of dollars in code violations. Can it be bought? Absolutely. 
Because what happens if you buy that with a million dollars in fines? Do you think the city thinks they're ever going to get that money? Nope. So what do you do? You mitigate them. So uh, code leads can be mitigated. So you go to the city and you say, city, you're owed a million? I'll give you a thousand. And they say, thousand, not enough, five thousand. Okay, still makes sense. I'll give you five thousand. <coughs> administrator fees. That's all they want. They only want administrator fees. They don't think they're going to actually get that money. It's going to be foreclosed and wiped out, and they're going to get nothing. So just like on a short sale, they'll rather take something than nothing to know that the property is going to be fixed, brought back into compliance, and mitigated down to the pennies on a dollar. So who uncovers the code leads or violations? A good title company. Yeah. And then you make the decision as a buyer. If you want the risk or not. And if you don't want the risk and you have one, you wholesale it then. Because there are investors that will buy it, fix it, bring it into compliance, and go before the special magistrate to mitigate the fines. They'll take the risk because they know the different cities and how much they'll reduce their fines by. A little tip, I know David talks about this a lot, but close your windows when you're rehabbing. How many rehabbers do we have? Close your windows. Code enforcement is on the hunt. They're on the hunt. They want to find anything they can to put a violation on a property. So just close your windows. We talked about pulling a lien search, not only a title search. And make sure the title company gives you lien search coverage. Write that down. That is important. There's an exception on your title commitment that says any matters pursuant to uh, Florida Statute 159. That's municipal issues. They leave that as an exception on pretty much every title policy, unless you request it to be removed. There's one title company, and I did a video on this. I'll never reveal their name, but there is one title company that makes you sign a hold harmless saying, we've ordered the titles a lead search on your behalf but we're not giving you coverage for it. I'm telling you, wild, wild west. They've ordered the lien search, they know the lien search issues, you've paid for the lien search, but you're not getting coverage for it. Makes sense out of that. So you want to ask, please, on your markup title commitment, which we spoke about, and I have a whole video on it so you can look at it, it talks about markup, make sure lien search matters are removed as an exception to the policy. It's a standard exception on every single title policy. And unless you request it to be removed, they what? They leave it. And if you have any code enforcement or municipal issues, they're going to say, oh, no coverage in title insurance. So now you're going to have to hope the title company will own up to a mistake. Oh, I missed something or something, you know. You're going to have to hope that they pay that. So be very, very careful. Chapter 159 is the Florida statute on that. Judgments and property liens. A question I get a lot, uh, I remember wholesaling years ago. Someone says, well, I have a judgment for a car loan from years ago. So I can't get into this business. Anytime I go to sell a property, I have to pay it. No, you don't. <clears throat> if you use land trusts, you don't have to. Because the trustee has no personal liability. You just can't get the money from the closing. Your company can or, or another entity. So you can wholesale if you have judgments, but judgments do attach to property. For 10 years, it can be renewed for 10 years. So if you have a money judgment for a defunct car loan or a credit card, and it's certified, meaning they stamped a certified stamp on it, so the judgment's recorded and then a certified judgment's recorded, it attaches to any property you own except for the property you live in. Question. If you use a land trust, could you get around the double closing by just assigning the, the changing the beneficiary. Yes, but try and explain to an investor assignment of beneficial interest, it's tough. Yes, I don't see very many of them. Can you? Yes. You can also buy it in a company and sell the company. That's another technique to get around double closings and deed restrictions. So you buy it in an LLC and then you'll sell the LLC, the interest in the LLC. Very rare though. So homestead property, I told you it's exempt. So if you, your house you live in is your castle, nobody can touch it. What's the famous case? Does anyone know? No. O.J. Simpson, said O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson is the famous case. They can't touch your house. The only ones that can touch your house is your mortgage company, your homeowners association, and the IRS. Oh, and your ex-spouse, your child support. But if you pay your bills, so you pay your taxes, you pay your mortgage, the rest nobody can touch. They can't touch your house. Your house is your castle. So the judgments do not attach. 
but any investment property you're going to buy, fix, and sell, or wholesale, attach. The second you buy it. So if you have a judgment in your name, you can't put property in contract in your name. Because the second we run a name search, the judgment's going to come up. So you need to be careful. Land trusts avoid judgments. Land trusts avoid city liens. People always ask, well, why? And we're going to get into that when we talk about land trusts. And I have a more advanced talk that I do on it. But basically, if you're an investor and you're buying in your own individual name, and you buy five properties in your name, and you have a code issue on one, it attaches to all five. Any property within the county. If you have a judgment on one, it attaches to everything. Why would you open yourself up to that kind of liability? Yes? How about if you have a company, you put it under the company. That's what we talk about. Okay. Yeah, so, so then the next technique is you want to buy in a company. So you buy all five properties in one company. Code violation against company A attaches to all the properties that the company owns. So that means you need to set up five different companies to own five different properties. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. It could. When I bought all of my property, I set up nine different LLCs. <clears throat> I had nine different tax ID numbers, nine different insurance policies, nine different annual renewals, nine different tax returns. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. When you can use a land trust, a separate trust for each one, and the beneficiary owns all of the trusts. Makes sense, right? What does it cost to start a trust? We'll talk about that. So it's very, very important to understand if you're buying and selling real estate, and I know some investors who take the risk and own property in their own name, great. And I know some that, that, that don't want the risk. So what I always tell people, and Phil will tell you, I always tell you, it depends how paranoid you are. That's what it, that's, your level of paranoia is your level of asset protection. But you better do it now, don't wait until later. I'm going to skip that one because we don't have too much time. But remember, you are a sitting duck. That's why anyone can attach to these properties. So you need to be very, very careful. Get these properties out of your name. And again, speak to an asset protection attorney about it. When we talk about land trusts and LLCs, people always ask, well, what is the best type of entity to buy real estate in? I always say I think LLCs are better. The reason being is because LLCs, if it's a multi-member LLC, you have a membership interest and someone can get a charging order and attach to the interest that you may or may not own. If you have a corporation, you have what? Shares, shareholders, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and they have shares. Shares can be what? Bought and sold. Bought and sold. Shares can be foreclosed on. So if you two own a property together and I foreclose your 25 shares, I now become your partner. There's nothing you can do about it. Where manage, managing members are different when you talk about an LLC. What you can Google, if you Google charging order, LLC, put Florida LLC charging order in Google and just read about it, you'll see why to have a multi-member LLC. Land trusts have two parties, trustee and beneficiary. Should they be the same? No, that defeats the purpose of doing a trust. They would be separate. You can be the trustee, you can have a third party trustee, uh, Mark Warder, the guy that, that authored Land Trust in Florida, he has a corporate trustee service for, I think, $100 a year. Um, you can do it however you want, but the trustee should be someone you trust. trust, right? Does that make sense? Trustee should be someone you trust. The beneficiary is you. The beneficiary is usually an entity. And this is the only time... Because people ask all the time, well, can I pay this company my proceeds? And I say, no. So you can have this LLC, and you say, well, I'm going to pay my other LLC. No. The only time proceeds from a sale can be dispersed off of the actual seller is by using a land trust. We can pay the beneficiary of the trust, and nobody sees the beneficiary. So what is a trust? It's an agreement. A four-page agreement or an eight-page agreement, depending on what agreement you're using, between you and you. You as trustee and your company as beneficiary or a third-party trustee. That was your question, right, Jeff? How expensive is it to set up? It is inexpensive to set up. How do you set it up? 
I told you at the beginning of the seminar, buy the book. That's the easiest way. Buy the Land Trust book. I think it's $26, $29. It comes with the Land Trust forms. It comes with an explanation of Land Trust, and you set it up. One, two, three, it costs you $30. Go to an attorney, $750 to set up a trust. You could be the trustee yourself, individually, and your LLC can be the beneficiary. So two separate entities. You are not, you can be individually, but it could be your LLC and it could be you individually as trustee. Kevin, sure. I remember last month, Mark said it's better to have a, to have a trustee out of state something. Listen, and again, that's more advanced and I don't like to give the legal advice because he's the attorney that speaks on it, but yes, it's your level of, what did I say? Paranoid. Okay. Paranoid. If you're really paranoid, you would have an out-of-state corporate trustee in Nevada that nobody knows. Or Marcus trustee, you'd pay the $100. So it depends on how scared you are that someone's going to take what you just worked hard to buy. So title is held with the trustee, rights of ownership are held with the beneficiary. So the beneficiary isn't recorded anywhere. There's no tax ID number for the trust. There's no articles of incorporation. There's no bank account. All it is is a fictitious holding entity holding title to the property. That's it. Real simple. So why you would use a trust? Well, first. It's private, right? We talked about that. Your level of paranoia, it keeps you private. Yes? Back to the other slide. Um, what if you pick up a rental property in a land trust? Is that the renter pay to? You're sitting next to the right person to talk about that. <laughs> we'll talk about it after because that gets pretty involved. But he'll tell you we've had extensive conversations on it. Essentially what they teach is to set up a separate company that could be the trustee and a manager, property manager. So it's not the owner. The mistake investors make is they put a property in a land trust and they have the tenant pay the beneficiary of the trust. And when the tenant falls on the property, the first question their attorney asks, bless you, is who do you pay your rent to? Gotcha. Understand? So you keep it separate. So it could be an out-of-state company. It could be, there's a whole level of I have investors that put property in their own individual name, and I have investors that get 10 levels deep, you'd never be able to find them. So you can go any level in between. It just depends. So it's private. There's no public record I talked about. You're protected from these. Trusts avoid probate. So a lot of people think, well, it's only my house I put into my family, my revocable trust. I have a very well-known investor, very good client of mine. His partner passed away and all of the properties were in land trusts. No, no, they were all in land trusts. So now he, who is partners with the person that passed away, and the person that passed away's wife, who was the heir to everything, were able to get together, formulate a plan, and sell all their property. Didn't have to go to probate, you don't have to let the courts determine who has the rights to it. So it makes sense to use a trust. Yeah. Easily managed properties. We talked about deed restricted properties. I don't see it that often, but you know, you did speak about it. So yes, it could help you avoid where they assign the beneficial interest in, in the trust, but you have to feel comfortable having that conversation with the person that's going to be the end buyer. They have to feel comfortable with what's going on. Investor partnerships is a good one. This is the one I like to tell people that in the state of Florida, to practice real estate without a license is what? It's against the law. Third degree felony. So if I have a property under contract and I put it out on my wholesale list, and you call me and say, you have a client that wants to buy the property and you don't have a real estate license, you've just committed a felony. Wholesalers commit felonies every day. That's why the well-known wholesalers all have real estate licenses. Because if they do not have a beneficial interest or their name is not on the contract, they can now do it as a real estate agent. If you're not a real estate agent, you have a problem. So you need to be careful. So land trusts are great because they partner on the trust. So when the DBPR comes to you and says, 
you practice real estate without a license, you say, no, I didn't, I had a beneficial interest in the land trust that was the buyer of the property, they go away. But if you can't do that, you have what? A problem. A problem. The investors all get their real estate license. It makes sense to have. Because now there's no question as to am I, the question you always ask yourself is, do I have a license, yes or no? If you do, you're good. If you don't, you have to ask yourself, do I have a beneficial interest in the property? Or am I practicing real estate without a license? And you need to be careful. They do come down on investors. And hard money lenders love land trusts. That's what the land trust agreement looks like. The rest is a bunch of just legal language. It's basically the day, the name of the trust, the beneficiary and the trustee, where you put, and then the land, the property. Real simple, sign, notarize, witness, and you're done. Do you need to keep, like, you got multiple properties, you need to put each property in a separate land trust? Yeah. Yeah, you would, because it doesn't cost anything to set up. And if you have the same, if you have five properties in the same trust, so I'll give you an example, one of my clients, these are all real life examples, that's why I love this presentation. One of my good clients had all of these properties, and I'll use his name, the Jones Family Trust. He bought every property in the Jones Family Trust. They were all separate land trusts, the only difference was the date. And thank God he put the date because the city tried to attach one code violation from a fire damaged property to every property he owned. Five attorneys, three underwriters all told him you cannot close. He came to me and I said, well, no, I can prove this case because you used a different date on every property. So I can show that this is a different trust, not subject to cross-contamination of the liens. I won, we closed. Okay. So it doesn't make sense? Yes. How'd they find out that we were all connected in the first place? Run his, they ran his name. He owned a property in the Jones Family Trust. They ran Jones Family Trust in public record and found five properties. So they attached a code lien against all five properties. It was prevented from selling any of them. But the names were not identical, you said. The names were identical with the exception of the right. date. Exactly. Right. Okay. And no title company or underwriter wanted to touch it. We were able to prove the case because they just don't understand land trusts. So we were able to prove the case and he was able to sell it. True story. That's what it looks like. So as I'm wrapping up, because I'm running out of time, and if you won the wine, by the way, come up after I have uh, three boxes. You can check your, your text. It'll tell you, you won. Just show myself for days the message. Um, so the question you want to ask yourself is, does your title company have an office? Do they have an office, or do they work remotely? Do they work out of their house? Do they have an office? Do they have clients? I don't need to explain to you my clients. They're in the room, but uh, do they have clients or are they doing three or four deals a month? You need to be very careful because the question, when you call them and say, I got to get this deal closed, the answer is, oh, so-and-so's out for lunch. Or how about so-and-so's off today? We'll work on it tomorrow. If they don't have multiple people to handle the transaction, you could find yourself having a problem if you're looking to wholesale. A retail deal, maybe you'll say, okay, I'll wait until tomorrow. It's okay. But on an investor deal, you need to be very careful because time is of the essence. It's quick. We're ready to close today. As Brad said, close a deal in one day. We do it all the time. So do they offer you value? That's a, a, an important question. I would say not just from a title company, but any vendor you're using or real estate agent. For me, doing your closing is my job. A real estate agent selling you a house is their job. Brad or David giving you a hard money loan is his job. What value does he give you? That's the important part. I tell you, like someone like David will go out and inspect the property. You know if he's willing to lend on a property, it's probably a good deal, right? Make sense? Brad, his unique ability is he's lending his own money. So he could literally look the property up and say, I'll lend on it and close today. It's his own money coming from his own bank account. It's unique. That's what you have to ask is, do they offer you value? Do they look out for you? Do they have a website is important. That's unique. Are they using, are you dealing with a closing company that's using a Hotmail or Gmail or AOL email address, an attorney that is, you know, real estate attorney at AOL.com? You need to be careful because what's gonna happen is when the problem occurs, it's too late. When your money is gone because their email was hacked, and he tells you, I'm sorry because I lost your $127,000. What are you going to do? 
Sue, yes, it's expensive. If you barely had the thousand dollar deposit, I don't know that you have the retainer to, to sue. So you need to be very careful. So you need to check. Make sure they have people. Make sure they're experts in what they do. Make sure they can explain to you the ins and outs of the transaction. We just got another investor from the Broward Real Estate Investor Club that came to us and said, you know, I'm closing with this title company. And I asked them, do you understand land trust? Can you explain? And he said, no, I can close in a land trust and title your property in a land trust, but I have no idea what a land trust is or how to explain it. So make sure they understand. Make sure they can explain to you code violations and exceptions to title policies and the contract. They brought me into David's club last month to explain the entire real estate contract. Go through it line by line and explain it. So you want to make sure there's experts, someone that knows and is going to look out for you. That's the most important part. That was Equity Max. He talks about it. As he said, he closes all of his deals with us as long as he has control. David does it as well. But you want to make sure it's investor friendly. Um, this is a wholesaler. It's all about fixing problems, right? Fixing problems. They have actually a really cool YouTube channel. If you look them up, it's called Cash Flow Talk. It's Michelle and Camillo. Uh, they have a cool, just look it up, Cash Flow Talk on YouTube. It's an awesome thing. They just talk about real life scenarios uh, that are going on. So it's pretty cool. And then here's my message for you, and then we'll wrap up. So who wants to read that for me? I have a book for you. Think and Grow Rich. Who wants to read it? Go ahead. When I fail to go after what I want, I am never going to have it. When I fail to ask, the answer is always no. When I fail to step forward, I'm always in the same place. And then your action is to identify one of your top priorities and commit to take bold action. I talked about this, and this is, I love to, to end with this, because what happens, and I'm, I'm registering all of your faces, is I'll never see you back here again. And that's a problem. That's a problem. I want to see you here next month. I want to see you at the next seminar. I want to see you at David's event next uh, on Thursday. I want to see you at the next boot camp, the next partnership program. You want to see us at a closing? I want to see you at a closing. But first, we got to take baby steps, right? My unique ability in this business, by the way, here's your book. Uh, my unique ability in this business is to hold your hand through the process because if you leave here and never come back, A, I haven't done my job, and B, I've done a disservice to you, and C, you're going to make no money. You can make money if you, what does it say? You're never going to have it if you don't go after what you want. Come to the meeting. I have a deal. Go to someone like Red or David. I, I want to buy the property. I want to get the money for it. Can you give me the money for it? If you don't ask, the answer will always be, what if you fail? Try again. Try again, right? Michael Jordan's failed how many times? Look up people, failure. Just look up failure on, on Google. And see all of the people that have failed time and time and time and time again. Do you think I've failed? I've been doing this 15 years. I posted on Facebook the other day our 15 year anniversary. And someone said, wow, I can't believe you're still in business. You were in business before the crash, during the crash, and you're still in business after the crash. My lowest month was three deals paying my, uh, my, my office manager on my credit card. True story, you can ask me. On the credit card, a cash advance because I couldn't make payroll. I didn't have enough closings. The next month was 10. I was, oh, great. The next month was back to three again. It's scary. But you have people in the room here that will help accelerate you. They'll help get you to the next level, and that's the important part. So these quotes are available, by the way. My shameless promotion for you. If you just go to Kevin's quotes, write it down. I do a daily quote. Does anyone get them here? Phil gets them? Yeah. A couple of you get them. So it's Monday to Friday. Every Monday to Friday at about 4.30 in the morning. It's set up the night before. I'm not up at 4.30. I send a quote and an action. I find it's better than just a quote. People email me every day saying, I took action and this is what happened. I've been doing this for about eight years now. I have hundreds and hundreds of people getting these every day. So it's cool. You just go to Kevin's quotes. You subscribe, it will send you an email that may go to spam to confirm. And then you just opt in. And once you opt in, you can do, I think it's one,
time a week, three days a week, or five days a week, you get the quotes. And they're things just like this. They're, it's called quote action. Title Tuesdays, and then I'll open questions. Title Tuesdays is our YouTube video. If you text the title to 31996, you will get a text message at 3 p.m. the day before it comes out to watch it. And it comes to your cell phone. If not, you can subscribe right on YouTube, right on our website, get the alerts. Um, and if you're afraid to text in, you can always opt out at any time. You just put stop and you'll be removed. So if you don't ever want to get a text from me, but you want to win the line, <laughs> just hit stop and you'll never get another message from me. Make sense? But here there's, I think we're on episode 92. I think 92 was this week's episode. So they're pretty cool stuff. Every week is something different. Next week we're talking about investors and taxes. How to, for wholesalers, for rehabbers, and for long-term renters. We have a tax advisor talking about taxes on all three levels and what you should do to look out for. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty unique. And then the only thing that I ask of you is if you can go to Google and Facebook and just leave me a thumbs up, five-star review if you enjoyed it. If you did a re review, you didn't think it was good, just call me. <laughs> but honestly, if you found value, because that's how I built my business, hopefully I've inspired you tonight, hopefully I've given you enough education that you can write a lot of questions down and just go out and make some money. But all I ask is just go to Google, Facebook, copy the review in the same place, copy and paste it, uh, and just let its independence title on Prospect Road in Fort Lauderdale. So not the one in Delray, not the one in, uh, not independent title, not independence title of Boca Raton. Uh, it's independence title on Prospect Road in Fort Lauderdale. I would appreciate it. And this entire video, thanks to Mr. Dave there, you can say hi to him, has been uh, put on Facebook Live. So uh, you can go check it out and it's all there if you have any questions. So I'll stick around until all questions are done. If anyone has a specific question, if you need to go, I understand. Uh, does anyone have anything specific, or I'll stay after to answer questions? Why, why is it difficult to assign a beneficiary? You know, to get it's, a double closing? it's different to explain. Not it's diff difficult to assign it. It's easy, just like setting up a trust is easy. It's difficult to explain to the end buyer, I have a deed restriction, pay me a fee, and I'll assign the trust to you. The same as an assignment of contract. Real simple. But it's a difficult conversation to say, here's my trust, give me $15,000. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's difficult to process. It's difficult for you, if you're inexperienced, to explain to the end buyer how much money you're making to buy the trust. They don't understand land trust. Most people don't. So you explain to them how a land trust is going to work, how you're going to assign the beneficial interest, and how you're going to collect the fee. It's easier to just double close. That's all I'm saying. So I don't see it that often. I would say maybe once every 90 days we'll see one. Yes. Okay. For the new finance purpose, mm -hmm. we did a profit from the city of Bali. Is it a program to the back into the practical or legal? Can you repeat right. his question? So his question is if he's doing a refinance and he owns a property in an LLC. And he wants to go to a bank to get a regular conventional loan because he's got good credit, verifiable income, and the bank's going to give him a loan. The bank says, well, we won't lend to your LLC, we'll lend to you individually. Mm -hmm. So you need to deed the property from your company to you individually. And then he's asking, is it illegal to deed it back to the company? Mm -hmm. So legally, yes. you're not allowed. Because there's what's called a due on sale clause. So as soon as you sell it back to your company, because you're transferring it, selling it. Even if you're not paying anything, you're transferring it. So technically, there is a due on sale clause that they could call your loan due. Practical, have I ever seen it happen? Meaning, have I ever seen people deed it back to their company? Yes. I would say you have a better chance probably deeding it to a trust, because then if they call, you say we put it into a trust for asset protection purposes, because they're gonna probably get the tax bill notification, insurance, and they're going to see the name of the company. So they could give you a problem. So you're not supposed to. But usually what, what the rule of thumb a lot of attorneys say is illegal, possibly. If you make your payments on time and never miss a payment, will they ever say anything? Probably. Does that answer your question? Kevin, I think in this case, he makes a co-beneficiary, a land trust, a 
know with your company if you would ask Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Using a trust, you would get away with it probably easier than putting it with your LLC. Oh, it should, but it's, it's again, is either one right? Probably not. Yes. Completely new to this land trust stuff. Where can I go to get more information and you know catch up on it? Like who could I? The book. What book? The <laughs> land trusts in Florida. Oh, you came in a little bit late. Yes. Right? So land trusts in Florida is the book. You can get it on Amazon. Okay. Mark Warda, W A R D A, is the author. He's an attorney. He wrote the statute on land trusts. Yep. He's a leading expert. We just did an event with him down here. He'll never come back here and probably do another one. Uh, we begged him to come do it, and uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic book. It was Mark Ward, I'm sorry? Ward, the book. You don't have to. I, I may even have a copy, but it just put land trust in Florida in Google. I thought I had a copy. I want to get it. Yeah, it's yeah, I mean, you, if you want to. So land trust in Florida, it comes with all the documents, you read up on it, you want to learn about land trust. What, what I think is most unique about the book is there's a chart in it, like a flow chart. That shows you the problem I was talking about before about having all these LLCs as ownership. So it shows you husband and wife, multi-member LLC, single member LLCs, land trusts. So that's kind of a good visual that shows you how to structure properties if you're what? Paranoid. If you're, but it shows you that, that structure. You can go anywhere in between. So land trusts in Florida, the author of Warda, W-A-R-D-K. What happens if I, I already have houses in LLCs and I want to put it into land trust? Okay. You can. Are there ta tax ramifications? As long as you're not changing the beneficial interest. So your LLC would still maintain ownership in, in the trust. So you'd probably be tax exempt for that. The challenge you run into is, which I've talked to other investors and said, well, any attorney can run a search and see that you owned it in your LLC that the managing member of the LLC is now the trustee of a land trust, the property was transferred to the trust and no consideration was paid, which tells the attorney that your LLC is probably the beneficiary of the trust. So again, I always say it's about planning properly now to prevent later. So can you do it? Absolutely. Are there benefits? Absolutely. But when there's a problem, will it expose you? Just like uh, I talk to Phil all the time about transferring property to do refinancing. He owns a lot of rental property, and, and you can ask him about it. And I tell him that you've just disclosed who you are by transferring it. But he got such a fantastic rate and got rid of that hard money loan, and he's cash flowing on everything. So you have to weigh the options. Does it make sense? Is it beneficial? And you, but you, you also have to, to, to still file all these tax returns and, and uh, fees because the benefit. Each, each LLC is a beneficiary. Without giving further tax advice and legal advice, if they're single member LLCs, they all flow through to a multi member LLC. Then, no, there's only one tax return. If everything, so that's why if you buy that book, you'll see the flow chart. Husband and wife, multi member LLC owned by husband and wife, single member LLCs to the top of the other book. So uh, that's probably a good route for you to go. Uh, but again, if it's done after the fact, you open yourself up to, I knew it was there. <laughs> you see, that's not a flowchart where it says, you and a spouse, master LLC, single member LLCs, files no tax return, land trusts, files no tax return, property. So that's a clear flowchart of how a well-structured investment portfolio Works. But I'll try to make my last question. No problem. Different, different topic that you mentioned. The uh, you said the, the, there's an app you could use to notarize a, a contract. Did I get that? Yeah. Not a contract. Contracts aren't notarized. Deeds, closing documents, mortgages, notes. We can do a fully automated online closing. E sign, e notarize, e record right from your house. You never have to show up at a title company. You can be out of the country, you can be on a cruise, as long as you have a US government ID, we can do the closing. Well, what about when you get this, this person to sign the contract, they want to verify it's them that signed it and the date that it's done? I mean, you could have it, I mean, if you want to use a service like that, but no. Contracts are not notarized. 
This is a specific to, to notarization. If you want to use something like eSign or something, that's different. <clears throat> but then this app can't, I'm, I'm not saying that this app can't be served that purpose as well? No, this app is used for notarization of documents. It's specifically called Notarize. So it's, it's used in connection with a closing that is, has notarization. The laws in the state of Virginia allow electronic notarization. So your notarization is being done by one of our closers in Virginia that's doing the closing. And it's all video recorded. So it wouldn't be used just for a contract. It's very expensive. It's used to do a full closing. Yes? So um, if you're using a uh, land trust, to do, you're also doing a, using a land trust to do a closing. And mm -hmm. uh, you're using a hard money lender. How, how do you structure that so the hard money lenders will be protected? You're wholesaling or you're the... You're the wholesaler. You're wholesaling, you're buying in a land trust. Yeah. You're going to sell it to another investor Correct. that is working with the hard money lender. So it doesn't affect your land trust. It doesn't affect your closing because if you're buying and selling, it's the person you're selling it to who now becomes the buyer that is going to work with the hard money so lenders. I would, I would need to actually close on it in the land trust, the contract yeah. held by the land trust. Yeah. So you would do a contract. So, so Mr. and Mrs. Jones selling to the 1234 Main Street Land Trust, that's yours. 1234 Main Street now becomes the seller on a second contract to whatever the buyer is. And the hard money lender will work with that buyer and that entity to lend their money. Okay, so the. Um, so then the end buyer would, would know how much you're making them. There's no way to... No, they would not know. If you're doing a double closing, because they don't know how much contract pays. They don't know. If you're buying a property for $100,000 in your trust, and you go to this buyer and you say, I'm going to sell you this property for $120,000, they never see the first side. Unless they have an attorney in demand to see the closing documents, they wouldn't see how much you're buying. That's why double closings are... Uh, used because of the large amounts of profit people are making, they do a double closing. So they fully close contract A and then resell that contract to an end buyer for a profit. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're doing it in the land trust, it works the same. Land trust is the same as buying in an entity or buying in your name. So think of it in the same theory of you buying a property in your own name and then you're not selling from your name to an end buyer. Just substitute your name to a corporation or LLC, to a land trust. It doesn't matter what entity you're using. They'll never see your contract, or at least they should. Make sense? Yeah, I have a land trust. A uh, rental property is paid for, and uh, I'm a beneficiary. Uh, the trustee is my ex-wife, God bless her. I said, look, if Kayla passed away, she's much younger than me. Can she, I say, if, I, if she can produce my destiny, can she sell? Property automatically as trustee. She's the trustee. She's the she trustee. doesn't need a death certificate. She doesn't nothing. She can. She can anytime. She can go and sell it today. Okay. Now the profit has to go to who she says the beneficiary is, which is you. Which is me. But I want her, you know, she, she probably died a lot. Now if something happens to you, she can she sell it. I told you, you know, sell it, give it to my son or whatever. Yeah. So that's the benefit. It I told her I'm nothing involved there, right? No problem. No, because it's in the name of the trust. So she can yeah. sell it. And she can do whatever she wants with it, because she's the trustee. But I learned something from you, so I, uh, because I collect the rent, so I have to switch the rent to my LLC. It's a risk, right? It's a risk that, that if someone falls in, it's always when there's a problem. So when there's a judgment because someone fell, and they have a million dollar judgment that exceeded your liability policy, now what? They're going to try and sue you. And like I said, the first question the attorney's going to ask, who do you pay your rent to? Collect the rent in the company. A separate company. An LLC. Separate company than the owner. You set up a company to be a property manager. Okay. Do you have to? No, but again, it's yeah. how much you want to do that. Yeah, exactly. When formulating the, the land trust, does the, the name of the trustee have to be in the name? Like so and so land trust, comma, so and so trustee? Or? So it's, a land trust can be named whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Most investors name it the property address, the 1234 Main Street Land Trust. I hate that because what happens is if some put the 1234 Main Street, ST Land Trust, some spell out street, and what they don't realize is you can't abbreviate the name of the trust. 
So if you have street, you need to spell out street or not spell out street, and it needs to be the same. So that's why I don't like using that. Some people will use uh, a different name. You can use the, uh, you know, trust number 5342. The important part is who's the trustee? The name of the trust can be anything. People use it for, for ease of, of um, record keeping by using the property address. Right. I don't necessarily like it, but that's what they do. But when you put your offers and stuff like that, does the name of the trustee need to be part of the name of, so for example, one, two, three, trust, comma, so-and-so trustee, does that happen? You could put just the name of the trust on it and you sign as trustee. Okay. You could put just the name of the trustee and sign as trustee and form the trust later. Um, it just, it doesn't matter. It's when we get to closing what's the important part. When using a trust, there's no liability to the trustee. So if you're buying, the only exposure is your deposit. So as long as you perform, they can't sue you for not performing. They can just take your deposit. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a thing back to that. So if you don't put the trustee name on that line, mm -hmm. how do you prove the trustee can sign on behalf of the trust? There are trust documents in the book that you would be able to provide showing. You never provide your trust agreement. So you, there are documents, a certificate of trust and stuff that you can show who has the authorization to sign if it's not on the contract. Okay, that answers that and I just brought up another question then. Mm -hmm. We've had situations where people, uh, the lender or whomever is requesting the Beneficiary. The trust. The trust. On a short sale? No. Not no. So the short sale. Yes. A lot of times they. I'm not saying you can't provide it to them. I'm saying you don't have to provide it to them. But if it's a if it's a contingency to your deal, you're going to have to provide it to them. A lot of times the attorneys want to see it just because they want to see it. On a short sale, a lot of times they request it because they want to make sure the scam from years ago, where investors were going to distressed homeowners saying, "Deed me the property." And I'll make you the beneficiary of the trust. So you still hold ownership, but I'm in control. So that's what they're trying to make sure. So there are reasons they ask for it. Um, you don't have to provide it, but if they ask for it, it's, there's not a problem sending it to them because it doesn't get recorded. As long as it goes to them and them only, it's not being recorded or sent out to anyone. So if there was a lawsuit, there's probably no problem. But one thing you have to think about is if there is a lawsuit and they subpoena the title company for the file, your trust agreement is part of that file. Right. So you don't have to legally provide it to them, but if they ask for it and they won't close any other way, you have to make a business call, whether you do or you don't. So that kind of segues into my question. I was looking at a house that a guy was selling, and um, when I talked to him, he was also and said, it's a short sale. But you put it in the land trust, and I guess it wasn't past the 90 days of infrastructure or whatever, and he was going to make me a trustee. Now, I mean, I didn't know anything about land trust, so I just, you know. See the answer? That's what I was just telling him, is it's hard to explain, because here, a perfect example, he was going to buy a deed restrictor, and he didn't understand trust. Yeah. So he really wants the property, but he doesn't understand it. So right. how does he get around the deed restriction? That is the only way, and it's very sophisticated and that's very the, rare. That's the only way? It's very rare that to see it happen. would make me the trustee, and I guess I would hold the property for the remaining amount and yeah. have to refinance or, or yeah. whatever. It's just more advanced. So would the closing happen after the 90 days? Like, would there, there be an official? No, the official closing. So, so it brings up two points. The official closing is when it's purchased in the trust. Okay. Then this investor is going to resign as trustee and appoint you successor trustee. And if that document's not recorded anywhere, the deed is still in that person's name as trustee. So is it risky? Yes, you have to know all the parties to it. Yeah. But then I would be able once I, I would be able to assign a beneficiary after said closing. Like, well, usually in deed restricted properties, you're already the beneficiary. So he's the trustee, you're the beneficiary. After closing, he resigns his trustee to you. You become successor trustee, and you're already the beneficiary, is usually how it works. There could be, after the fact, an assignment of beneficial interest, which isn't recorded in public record. But again, that gets 
uh, more events. Buy the book and read up on assigning the beneficial interest of a trust and understand a little bit more about it. It's a whole seminar. Uh, I mean, we gave a whole two-day seminar talking about uh, land trusts and assignments of beneficial interest and resignation of trustee, how it should be done and the problems that you run into. So it's a bit more advanced. The book that you have, is it, um, is it a, I assume it's the latest edition, so I have Yeah, this one's 10, I believe. Yes, I've already read it from him. Yeah, yeah, you can buy it directly from him. Um, Sam, it comes with the document. This one, I think, is the 10th. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah, 10th edition. This is the most recent. This is the one he handed out at the event we did the other uh, the other month. So it's pretty cool. All right, so that's it. I, I know the, the girls in the back thank them very much for, for waiting and, and putting on this event. They're fantastic. And, uh, if you won the bottles of wine, this comes show David the text. Um, three of you in the room probably have it. And uh, that's it. Have a good night. Hopefully I'll see you next month, right? <laughs>